Hello, my name is Kim Eagle from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm delighted to be with you today on day two of the ACC meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, April 7th. We're covering the late breaking trials that are being presented at this meeting. There are many of them. Um, and I'm delighted to have several guests covering the most important. We have Pyle Coley from Denver, Colorado, Ajay Kirtani from New York City, and Darren Kumbani from uh, Dallas, Texas. Let's start with a, a, a study called Reduce uh, AMI. Uh, we know beta blockers are an old friend. They've been around forever in the treatment of beta blocker uh, in, in patients with MI. But this is an interesting trial asking the question, should we continue using them in patients with preserved DVAP, preserved DF? Uh, Pyle? Yes, Kim, you're exactly right. Beta blockers are one of my closest friends, in fact, as a cardiologist. And I really love this trial because it's science that challenges what I do. It's science that changes what I do every day at the bedside. And I was really interested to see these results. So, you know, we've been using beta blockers, especially after an acute MI, but that was really back in the era when the MIs were large and they dropped your ejection fraction. So this really asks the question, what about now when we get our patients to the cath lab quickly, they probably have smaller myocardial, you know, infarcts and they don't have a reduction in LBEF. So they looked at patients with MIs, both STEMIs about a third and non-STEMIs about two thirds uh, and an ejection fraction greater than 50%. And what was interesting about this trial is that it was registry based. So they were looking at sort of endpoints based on the registry. It was randomized and it was open label. So those are certainly obviously limitations when we're thinking about how to interpret the data. And they randomized patients to beta blockers, uh, either metoprolol, which was about 62% of patients, or bisoprolol, and pretty good sized doses of these two medications. So metoprolol, 100 milligrams, or bisoprolol, 5 milligrams, and looked at hard endpoints, the composite of death of any cause or myocardial infarction, nice long follow-up of three and a half years, over 5,000 patients. And really what they found, we were using beta blockers and we didn't need to because there were no difference in that primary endpoint. And there was really no difference amongst the subgroups either. So certainly I know this is going to change my practice in an acute MI management setting. The chronic coronary disease guidelines that came out in 2023 already had started pushing beta blockers sort of off of the table for some of our chronic CAD patients who didn't have other indications for beta blockers and were more than one year out of their MI. But this really makes me think even in an acute MI setting where we normally think about reduced myocardial oxygen demand and reducing chronotropy and inotropy, maybe now that my colleagues, Aram and Ajay, are revascularizing so quickly, I don't have to think about beta blockers as much. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, the beta blocker story really predated revascularization and reperfusion, uh, and this is a completely new era. This is probably a practice changing trial for us, and I, I think it's a, a commendable to the investigators that they carried this off. Really a, a great study. You know, we need we need better therapy for shock. Um, you know, time after time, we've seen new therapies come onto the horizon and they've been uh, dismally disappointing. Uh, there's a really important trial presented today called Danger Shock. Ajay, tell us about this trial. I couldn't agree with you more. And um, I'm just so excited to be able to be here today and have a randomized trial of the hemodynamic support device in cardiogenic shock that once again um, was designed to kind of challenge conventional wisdom. Here in the United States, there are many people who feel that we need to put in hemodynamic support early up front because that's the way to treat shock. And then there's others who look at the observational data and show that there's increased bleeding, increased mortality, even in observational studies with these devices. So really got to give it to our colleagues from Europe, um, the, the Danish who were joined by the Germans, who were joined by folks in the United Kingdom, who over a period of 10 years enrolled a patient population of 355 patients who could be randomly assigned to impella, so percutaneous unloading of the ventricle versus conventional care. Now, what these investigators are really careful to do, though, is that they selected patients that had shock but were not comatose. They were not posted rest and comatose. In fact, they had to have elevated lactates, also hypotension, but yet were not in extremis so as to potentially see a beneficial signal. And that's what they showed. The trial was powered for mortality. It was only 355 patients, but yet they were able to show a reduction in, in mortality with the use of this device. Um, what I would say, though, is that um, this also, has also been published in the New England Journal simultaneously, and the byline is that routine use of this device can potentially improve mortality. I don't think this is routine use at all, 
because the investigators were careful to select those patients who could possibly benefit and exclude those patients for whom there could be no benefit. Further, all the complications seen that you expect when you use these devices, such as increased bleeding, increased sepsis, increased vascular complications, and also even the use of dialysis were greater among those that were treated with the hemodynamic support device. Perhaps that's because there were more patients that died with or were treated conventionally, but it shows us that we really need to be selective and think about who we're using these devices in rather than use them indiscriminately with just true routine use. Further, the final point I'll make is that this trial enrolled over a period of 10 years. That's hardly routine use to and randomize 355 patients. But so important to do this study. It really sets the stage for future research and so nice to finally have a therapy that moves the needle somewhat with respect to shock. I, lo I love your analysis of this. I think we, we don't want to extend this to all of shock, but within the narrow confines of the patients enrolled, isn't it wonderful to have a device that appears to have benefit? Uh, certainly, it's a landmark trial and one that is going to change practice, I think. There's another study that I think is convincing us that shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapy may be beneficial in many of our patients who have ACS or receive stents. There's one called uh, Ultimate DAP at this meeting that's really important. Aaron, tell us about that trial. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, today is really an exciting day. There are you know, a lot of practice-changing trials, and I think this is potentially going to be one, um, one of them as well. So, you know, um, uh, how long we keep people on dual antiplatelet therapy after PCI, particularly after ACS PCI, has been a moving target. You know, more recent studies such as Twilight suggest that we can de-escalate to, uh, you know, potent P2Y12 uh, inhibitor therapy such as ticagalor after three months. Um, what is unclear is if you de-escalate it at one month, you know, would that be uh, potentially okay in patients undergoing PCI for an ACS indication? So that's kind of what um, these investigators sought to study. Uh, so this was a really well done study. It was done um, primarily in China uh, with other centers uh, in Asia. Um, the design is slightly complex, so I'll just mention it very briefly. They started with a little more than 3,500 patients who were initially randomized to ibis guided PCI or angiography guided PCI. So that's a separate study. And then once they got to 30 days on DAP with aspirin and ticagalor and had done that successfully without a bleeding or ischemic complication, then at that point, 3,400 of those were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to either de-escalation to aspirin, uh, to sorry, ticagalor monotherapy uh, primarily 90 BID or continuing DAP, which is what sort of the guidelines should recommend um, for one year with aspirin and ticagalor. Now, what they showed is uh, the primary um, bleeding endpoint, um, which was, uh, you know, BART 2, 3, or 5 bleeding, was significantly reduced in favor of uh, ticagalor monotherapy um, compared with DAP for 12 months. And when they looked at multiple definitions, it appeared to be all um, uh, in the direction of benefit for a shorter term DAP. And then um, when they looked at the uh, ischemic endpoint, there was no difference. And this included, you know, all cause mortality, stent thrombosis, et cetera. So this suggests that you could uh, potentially, um, you know, derive a bleeding benefit without being a penalty on the ischemic, uh, on the ischemic side. Um, you know, one thing I will also say is about 30% of patients in this trial were um, enrolled uh, with an underlying diagnosis of ST elevation MI. This subgroup in particular has had a higher risk in other studies. Um, and um, in this trial, sort of all comers, it appeared that the benefit was sustained. Um, although when you look at the subgroup analysis, perhaps the event rates were a little higher uh, on the ischemic side for patients who present with the ST elevation MI. So I do think we'll still need to be thoughtful about that subgroup. But in general, this trial suggests that, you know, allowing patients with, who present with ACS and undergo PCI with a drug-eluting stent um, you could potentially de-escalate to ticagalor monotherapy after one month of dual antipeda therapy. So again, although this was done primarily in Asia and, you know, 90% of patients were Chinese, and so there's a question about the generalizability of these um, findings to, you know, other populations, for example, that, you know, in the U.S., um, I do think this is potentially a practice-changing trial. Yeah, I like the trial a lot. Obviously, you get to the 30-day mark, and if you're dealing with a patient that you think is high risk for bleeding, then this gives you some ammunition to say, okay, we've gone through that highest risk period and it's okay to de-escalate uh, and it's probably safe. And certainly the bleeding rates were dramatically lower in that group. 
uh, just an honorable mention trial that I would encourage our learners to take a look at today also is called TACT-2. Um, you know, the chelation therapy for coronary disease has been around a long time. The first TACT trial was uh, published many years ago. It suggested possibly a subgroup benefit in diabetics. Uh, and this NIH-sponsored uh, trial looked at uh, patients with diabetes and MI and asked the question, does chelation therapy benefit those patients uh, over a period of time? And did not support the, the general notion of chelation therapy in this higher-risk group of patients. So perhaps that that chapter is is finally coming to closure based on uh, excellent science. I want to thank uh, Pyle and Ajay and Darren for great coverage of important trials being uh, presented today at ACC 24 in Atlanta. This is Kim Eagle for ACC.org, and I'm out. <laughs>